So Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 through chapter 10, verses 8. Then Jesus made a circuit of all the towns and villages. He taught in the meeting places and reported kingdom news and healed their bodies, healed their bruised and their hurt lives. When he looked out over the crowds, his heart was broken. So confused and aimless they were, like sheep with no shepherd. What a huge harvest, he said to his disciples. How few the workers. On your knees, he said to the disciples, and pray for harvest hands. The prayer was no sooner prayed than it was answered. Jesus called 12 of his followers and sent them into the ripe fields. Jesus gave the disciples power to kick out evil spirits and to tenderly care for the bruised and hurt lives that were around them. This is the list of the 12. Simon, they called Peter or the rock, Andrew, his brother, James, Zebedee's son, John, his brother, Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew, the tax man, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon, the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot. Jesus sent his 12 harvest hands out with this charge. Don't begin by traveling to some far off place to convert unbelievers, Jesus said to the disciples, and don't try to be dramatic by tackling some public enemy. Go to the lost. Confuse people right here in the neighborhood. Tell them that the kingdom is here. Bring health to the sick, he said to the disciples. Raise the dead like I have done. Touch the untouchables. Kick out the demons. You have been treated generously, so live generously. God's word for us today. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts and minds be acceptable to you, O God, who is our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Two weeks ago, during the first annual meeting, not the second, but the first, the question part of the meeting, when we were talking about the staffing study, Cordelia Carey said something that I am still and have been pondering ever since. She said, right here in the microphone over there, I am not sure this congregation knows what its mission is. That's what she said. At first, I was thinking to myself, well, of course it does. We have a mission statement that's in all of our literature. We did a mission study, although that's been three years ago. And I preach, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit quite regularly, I thought. Hmm, I wonder why she said that. Surely the congregation members know this FPC Napa's mission. But then I began to think and hear your voices inside my head. It happens sometimes in the week while you're preparing for a sermon. And one congregation member said to me, our mission is to feed the homeless. And another congregation, congregation member said, we need more young people. And another congregation member said, we need more Bible studies, like three a week. And another member said, we need ministry to the aging, more visitation and spirituality groups in those facilities. And another said, we need to share the love of God with our community in Napa by being involved in government. I so appreciate what Cordelia said, because since then I have been thinking and praying, and then it came to me. You all have a mission here at FPC Napa, it is just not the same mission. You have lots of different things you want, but how do you narrow it down to the one thing you want? In the coming months, it will be important that you come together and explore how your mission can become unified. My last Sunday here at FPC Napa will be July 23rd. And your new permanent pastor will begin on Tuesday, August 1st. 
He will have time to meet his staff the week of August 1 through 4 and move into his new office while I'm on vacation. And then I will return back and we will have a beautiful pastoral overlap the week of August 7 through 10. Together, alongside your new pastor, you will again discover what the FPC Napa mission is. What priority will you focus on as a church? Right now, you have many wonderful agendas, but in reality, you can't do all of them well. So pick a few and make a difference for God. But all these things beg the question in our text today. How do disciples become apostles? When does following turn into being sent? Over the past few weeks, we've watched in our scripture lessons that the first disciples of Jesus gathered in fear after the crucifixion. They were amazed at Christ's resurrection and ascension into heaven. And they received the Great Commission to go make disciples, which was our lectionary passage last week. We have seen the disciples return to Jerusalem with joy, praising God, and we've looked on as they've gathered once more in the upper room together, praying to receive what Jesus had promised them, prayer from on high, you might say. At Pentecost, we see the Holy Spirit blows them out into the city to share the good news that Christ is born. Somewhere in there, we've been transformed. Somewhere in there, they've been transformed from disciples into apostles. From frightened followers to bold announcers of the gospel. Somewhere in there, they've changed from apprentice craftsmen to master builders in God's kingdom on earth. The disciples have joined Jesus in the work of healing and driving out demons and preaching Christ. They are no longer disciples, but apostles. No longer following behind, but sent out ahead to lead the way. How did this happen? Matthew's gospel gives us a clue, but it isn't at the end of the story as you might expect. This transformation begins much earlier, and if we've been there at the time, we might have even noticed that the change was happening. It's one of those things that only makes sense in looking back. And it says in our scripture, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Then Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out, to cure every disease and every sickness. Did you catch that? Did you hear where the switch happened? Listen again. Then Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority over the unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. Right there in the middle of it all, Jesus calls his 12 disciples and gives them authority to cast out the unclean spirits and cure every disease and sickness. And there is when they become the apostles, the sent ones. Done is their learning in some ways. Done is their apprenticeship. Done is their, I think we know what we're doing. Now Jesus says, go. And he pushes them out and makes them apostles. Authority, as you probably know, comes from diff two different directions. There's the authority that gets handed down from you from above. And there's also authority that comes from those who place themselves under your authority. 
Disciples who place themselves under the authority of Jesus are given authority to act in his name. Let me say that again. Disciples who place themselves under the authority of Jesus are then given authority to act in his name, performing the same works and speaking the same truths that he did. And that's how they become apostles. That's how we, friends, become apostles. I think sometimes our unwillingness to fully submit to Christ's authority over us keeps us from experiencing the power of Christ's authority and work through us. There's something else I want you to notice about this passage. Matthew uses a special literary device to help us get the point. He arranges his ideas to form a sort of mirror image that reflects on each other, revealing the main idea that's at the very center. Let's take a look. At the beginning, Jesus is doing what Jesus does, right? He's traveling around from town to town. He's going to houses. He's curing people. He's healing the sick. He's teaching in synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. That's no surprise. But at the end of the day, today's passage, he sends his followers out to do what? The exact same thing that he has been doing. As you go, he says, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven is near. And then he says to them, cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. Next, Jesus has compassion on the crowds. I can imagine he looks out and he sees them like, what's going on next? Their confusion and they're lost. Like sheep without a shepherd, Jesus says. Next, to the end of the passage, Jesus tells his disciples to go to the lost sheep of Israel. Then we get to the sending. Jesus explains that the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. And he tells his disciples to ask the Lord of the harvest to send more laborers. Guess what happens in the mirror? The disciples to whom Jesus has been talking become the apostles that Jesus sends out with specific instructions. This brings us to the heart of this message in this pericope today. The point Matthew wants us to get, these are apostles, not the disciples any longer, not the apprentices. They are the sent ones, and here are their names. And they listed them. And do you notice that Matthew's lists them two by two? I don't know if you've ever noticed that. This is not an accident. When we are sent into the world to proclaim good news, we dare not go alone. The buddy system has always been Christ's model for discipleship, and it's the best model for apostleship too. And there's something else we need to remember about these disciples who have become apostles. They are all from very different backgrounds hold very different opinions, and have very different ideas about the Messiah. Social class, politics, theology, you couldn't ask for a more diverse bunch of 12. We have Matthew the tax collector who upholds and profits from, by the way, the Roman occupation, right alongside alongside Simon the zealot who wants to overthrow the government There's Peter leading the pack with his impetuous loyalty, and Judas the betrayer bringing up the rear. We have Thomas who blurts out absolutely whatever is on his mind, and Thaddeus who, if he ever utters a word, never gets quoted in any version of any story. How on earth did these 12 men manage to all get along What qualifies them to become the spokespersons for the kingdom of God? It's the same thing that qualifies you and me. The same thing that keeps us united in faith even when we disagree. It's the one thing that's the most important. It's not about us. It's about the one who's doing the sending. The one who gives authority, who walks beside us, who promises to never leave us, 
it's Jesus. So when we have those moments of feeling loss, feeling unhappiness, feeling distraught, feeling pain, guess who's the one that calls us? Jesus. Over the past three years, you have walked with me as I have walked with you, learning and teaching each other what it means to follow Jesus and be sent by him. We may have disagreed on some things, but we certainly have rejoiced in so many others. I know I have grown deeper in faith and stronger in my love of God and neighbor, and I hope many of you can say the same. And while for this season together you have given me authority to serve as your pastor, I have sought to be faithful to the authority God has placed on my life when God called me into the ministry 34 years ago. In six weeks, 44 days, you will welcome a new pastor, and I know you will place your trust in him as your spiritual leader. And this is how it should be. You are ready for a new chapter in the history and story of First Presbyterian Church Napa, and I'm confident God plans to make it a good and great and excellent chapter. But here's the thing. The core of the good news of the kingdom of God is found right here among you all. In the people who chose to follow Jesus, you love God with all of your heart, your soul, your mind, and strength, and I know you love your neighbors too. I've seen it. You, my friends, are the apostles, the sent ones. You are the gospel. You are the good news. You take Christ's good news wherever you go. The center of the story of how disciples become apostles is the people who are named two by two, very different from each other, as all get out, but united in one thing, Jesus. Our scripture today is centered on the idea of the covenant promise. From God's promise to claim the people of Israel as God's own to Christ's promise to be with us always as he sends us out. We have been given the opportunity to respond to God's infinite grace with promises of our own, to keep God at the center of our life, to share God with others, to remember God and pray with Jesus each and every day. What will your promises to God and to this Napa community be as you seek out this new chapter in your church. Friends, you are loved. Amen.